I've learned over the years that when you're ministering and you're listening to messages and you're doing things, that God will use messages. I know this sounds taboo or taboo or tomato. That you could actually hear a message from another man of God and use it. See, because we come from a we come from a church culture that you produce it and you impress the people and you're amazing. We build churches around the the character or the um, temperament of the pastor rather than the person of Jesus. And maybe you remember when Peter, after he denied Jesus three times, and Jesus went and met him out on the boat when he was fishing and couldn't catch anything. And he met him on the beach and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know that I do. Do you remember what his response was? Feed my sheep. The problem with individuality being so overrated in America, we start to focus more on our creativity and how we should be different than how we can connect and do something better. You know what I mean? We love the individual. So God told me a long time ago, Cal, do you love me? And I said, well, yes, Lord, you know that I do. I've denied you three times. <laughs> times your grace. And he said, feed my sheep. And as I started to do this, and I started to become discouraged on what my capacity was or how I measured up, God said, you don't get it. I asked you to feed my sheep. I didn't ask you to make all the food. Some of you didn't get that. We're so impressed by our own revelation, we stop to see what God's doing in the body of Christ. We are so convinced that it has to be something that tracks back to us. We forget to give people what they need instead of it being something that impresses them in us. So as you start to see the young men and women in this church start to come up and people start to minister messages and start to walk these things out and grow and walk in their calling, we're called to come around and embrace that, not say, oh, well, that person's not as good as so-and-so. See what I'm saying? There's a critical church spirit that's literally keeping the church in its place and not allowing it to rise up. Because we can just go home and watch stuff on TV or TV or jump on YouTube and go, that's awesome. Okay, well, that's Texas. You're in Chandler. <laughs> Welcome to CFT in Chandler. It's like people are like, well, I go to this church, but I send my tithe to, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to help you. Can I, can I just talk to you a little bit as we're moving into the next level of church? It's just like a family meeting. <laughs> the tithe belongs to the storehouse. I was talking to an engineer the other day. He has his own business now. We're friends. He goes to another church. talking to. Him. He goes, well, you know, I, I tithe my 10%, but I break it up. Well, it didn't say, you know, five sets of 2%. He said 10%. He says, yeah, but I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't give it all to the church. I give it other places. And I said, no, you give 10% to your church, and then you give your offering above that to other places. See, it's easy to talk to people when they don't go to your church because they know you're not trying to get anything from them. You say it to people in your church, they're like. <laughs> but I said, here's the deal. The tithe belongs to the storehouse. That means you drop it off. He goes, what's the storehouse? I said, where are you receiving ministry? Where do you attend? That's the storehouse. He goes, well, I don't know about that. And I said, you know what? You don't know because the moment you take control of your tithe, it's no longer a tithe. It's now an offering. Yeah. See, we decide where we give offering. If you want to give to mission, if you want to give to this person, if you want to do that, that's, that's all offering. But tithe is something that already belongs to God. You don't get to determine what happens to the things that belong to God. He already told you what to do with it. Yeah. The moment you control it, it's no longer a tithe. Now it's an offering. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're called to drop off our tithe, <coughs> and then we get to wrestle with God over our offerings. <laughs> if you're wrestling over your tithe, we need to go back to the basics, and we'll get to that this year too. Amen? Amen. <laughs> or uh-oh. <laughs> right? Just basic teaching, just simple. It's the fun stuff. And he goes, well, I don't really agree with you. And I said, okay. You don't have to. I said, if you feel moved by sending some of your tithe to our church, I'll give you the address. <laughs> He goes, no, no, he always looks like that. So stretch marks. I titled this, Can You Spare Some Change? Look at the person next to you and say, can you, can you spare some change? You didn't do it. What you about to say to tell her? She needs it more than you. I need Alex and you to tell her. You're like, I just want to go to a huge church where I'm safe. Holy Spirit will find you because this church will get huge and you still will be found. Amen. So stretch marks. Your, your strength is in the stretch. You can really test 
the elasticity of something or the strength of something when you begin to pull on it. That's when you really know it's strength. Something just, you know, you can have something fragile and you can have something strong, but you don't know until it's tested. So we like to appear strong, but we hate to be tested. Amen? I, a guy, I, you know, my gifting is primarily apostolic and evangelist. But, you know, I, I move in and out of the prophetic on occasion. But my prophetic words aren't like fillowy and, you know, 17 sentences. They're like, bam. And you give them, they're like, you know, so people don't come to me for that often. <laughs> so I came to me and said, do you have a word for me? I said, that's funny. I do. Like, seriously. I said, I do. I just got it this morning. He said, what? I said, I see the Lord this year. He gave me a picture of a taffy pulling machine. And I saw him stretching you. To capacity, and right as you're about to break, he rewound it and stretched you again, and that's what he has for you this year. And he was like, "That was it." That year, he took over a a youth ministry. That year, all kinds of stuff changes. He got married. I mean, just like seven things happened. And I remember him calling me at the end of the year and go, "That was accurate." But you know what? He was stronger because he was tested. So the strength is in the stretch. Come on, let's stand up and greet five people around you real quick. <laughs> Your family don't count? <laughs> kind of throws it off. I just did that so I could figure out what I was going to say. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We ask you just to speak to us, Lord, directly, plainly. Lord, that we didn't come here just to be challenged. Lord, we came to be changed. We came here that we would fulfill our call and become more like you, that we would walk in the promises that you have for us, and we would be a blessing to those around us. Lord, stretch us that the city might be reached. In Jesus' name, and everybody said? Amen. 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 Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. The book of Acts is an amazing book. That's where it all started. That's where the church began. So when you go back to how the church should look, you go to the book of Acts. If you want to see how the church is corrected and directed, then you can read the rest of the epistles. But it says this. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, about 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple of the gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg for those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as John did. Then Peter said, look at us. I love this. See, if you give God your attention, he now can exceed your expectation. I like how it started. Look at us. You know what I mean? This isn't some casual meeting. It's like, hey, hold on. I know everybody walks by, you're doing this all day long, you're forgetting, look at us, right? So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from him. See, it's difficult when people are asking us for things that we don't have. You know, you ever had like, your kid's like, I want a, I want a ball, I want a ball. Or no, it was, I want candy, that was it. So... <laughs> Let's get something more. I want candy. I want candy. I, want, I was like, I don't have any candy. I want candy. It keeps going on and on. And I won't tell you which one of my children was because someone in this room. So he said, I want candy. I said, look, I don't have any candy. I want candy. I said, hey, I want a baseball. And he goes, I don't have a baseball. And I said, and I don't have any candy. <laughs> See, Peter didn't focus on what he didn't have, which was money. He focused on that which he had and decided to give it freely. See, because not, we're not always asking for what we need. Generally, we're just asking for what we want. Oftentimes, what we want will get us through the day, but what we need will change us for a lifetime. 
So Peter recognized this. And he said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Move. Do something. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit. See, don't get too used to the way that I am right now. Don't get used to seeing the people in this church a certain way. See, because God has started a process in the people in this church, he's started a level of faith that he'll bring to completion. So stop expecting to see people showing up the same year in and year out. Don't expect the church or the people in it to look like it does in 2018 the way it does in 2017. Don't identify you or other people's condition based on the past and the present, but on the word of God in the future. That's what we talk about. We're a church of inspiration. Believe that people are going to change. Believe that people don't have to sit in the same seat every weekend to be blessed. <laughs> They're going to the new building. I was going to be confused. They're going to find their new spot. <laughs> you know, because you kind of settle into an area. You know what I mean? You're like, okay, they are my seat, but I can move over here a little bit. You know, as long as you have a general. We, we are naturally built to conform or to come to a place of consistency, which is good. But also, we have to allow God to stretch us so that something new can happen. As Pastor Mike would say, in the next year, I will get better, stronger. You ever heard Pastor Mike preach? I love it when he does that. He's like, but do you expect change in others, really? And do you really even expect change in yourself? See, God wants to change the way we look at change. That you can believe that next year is not going to be like this year. You know what I mean? I talked about sowing and reaping. Be careful the words you sow about other people and about yourself. Oh, they'll never change. You ever hear people say that? So how's so-and-so doing? Well, you know, it's, how's Alex doing? He's Alex. Now that could be something amazing or that could be something terrible. Rarely is it something decent. You know what I mean? It could be like, wow, you know, Alex, he's constantly changing, pushing, believing, hoping, or it could be like, Alex, you know, Alex. <laughs> But we all have the potential to fall into ruts or grooves. And they say that a, a groove or a rut is just a casket with both sides kicked out. That everybody has some weird dream that has been put in us by our culture that you get to a certain age and then you just cruise through life. You go to a beach and get a drink with an umbrella on it and you want to do that every day. Okay, I went to Hawaii. It was awesome. The weather was better than people tell you. I'm not going to lie. And after about 10 days, I was ready to be off islands. You know what I mean? It's amazing. I will go back. I don't want to be there. I don't, that's not my destination. That's my vacation. Your destination is attached to your calling. Your calling is not vacation. Amen? Like I saw some people, I went on a liveaboard board one time. It was like a week long. You just get out on a, a boat and they take you out in the middle of the ocean and you die for like three days for like an entire week. And we saw some people that were like, yeah, we're on vacation. Three to six month vacation. And the person I was with looked at him and said, you're not on vacation. You quit. You have to restart your life in six months. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't want to get my body in a, we want to do absolutely nothing for six months and then engage. Like I, my, my CrossFit coach said, you know what, Cal? It's easier to stay in shape than get in shape. I said, why do I feel like you're saying that to me and not to you? And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them. See, you can spare some change if you're up for it. And one of the questions is, are you up for it? Are you really up for change? People talk about it. Yeah, that's cool. They watch videos. They feel better. They go to conferences. They feel better. But I'm talking about sustainable change and heading in the right direction. Right? It's funny because the are you up for it and are you down with it? mean basically the same thing. I don't know if you're turned up or turned down. <laughs> or if you're up with it or down with it. or Anyways. But isn't it funny that it means the same thing because sometimes you are up with it. Sometimes you're down with it. Which means there's different positions. Sometimes you walk in the position of Peter and Paul where you're up and you can reach down. But sometimes you're down. You need to reach
each other. But if you can spare some change, whether you're up with it or down with it, you're still with it. Amen. 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 So whether you're in a high point in your life or a low point in your life right now, God says, can you spare some change? Are you willing? So the book of Acts, it's awesome. It's spreading the gospel. It starts with a few people in Jerusalem as a sect of Ju Judaism. And then it goes to Rome and basically to the message that's reached the entire world, the entire earth. So in order for the gospel to spread, the disciples of Jesus had to stretch. I'm not talking about the 12 disciples. I'm talking about you. Like, no, talk about them. If the gospel is going to spread... We have to stretch. Look at the person next to you and say, you got to stretch. And try not to look offended when they tell you. See, we are stretching right now. We're stretching to get into the building in two weeks. Next week, on Saturday, we're all going to meet at the building. As soon as we get the keys, texts are going to go out. We're all going to meet at the building, walk around, pray, you know, see what shape it is, see what we're going to be able to do. And then next week after service, right after we have a truck outside, we're tearing all this down and shoving it in the truck and taking it over there. Amen. <clears throat> like just, we don't even know what we're getting into. Good, bad, or ugly. The following week, we're having service. <laughs> pray for chairs. Bring my own. <laughs> That's right. We did that. Didn't we do the lawn chair service like before we had the chairs? Like, everybody bring your own lawn chair. But some people had cooler lawn chairs than others and everybody got upset so they do a forgiveness and offense teaching my chair so many was the same although the the place that we're moving into in the sanctuary you might not have noticed in the video there's four black chairs up front for the special people we'll just leave them empty in like random spots and see who thinks they're special enough to sit in just start doing awkward things that make people look around someone said can we get some real nice like couch area stuff like that I said we can but they'll always be in the front because we never promote the back right that's not the same thing about the people sitting in the back or the people sitting in the front but you don't want to put the coolest stuff in the back and don't be surprised when the first 10 rows are empty and the pastor's like how'd this happen you created it it's not the Holy Spirit bad plan so people who carried the gospel to new areas were stretched and people you ever hear people say man if I could just walk when Jesus was on earth you know what Jesus was hard on his disciples. Now, you need to read the Bible. It wasn't like, hey, this is awesome. What do I feel like doing today? It was like, bam, bam, teaching, correction, bam, teaching. See this little kid? Be like this. You're jacked up. Why lack of faith? Do this. Do this. Like, you know, I don't even know if we can handle it. You know what I mean? Like, we're just trying. I just, I'm convinced that God doesn't even show us how we work in the flesh. Because if we did, we'd just quit. So he just shows us little pieces at a time so we can change. He doesn't want to discourage us. He doesn't want to discourage us. So, also, you have to realize that stretching produces one thing. It produces dependence on God. See, it's in the times of your heaviest demand that you tap into his eternal supply. If everything he throws at you in your life can, you can handle in the physical, there's no need for the supernatural. But it's when we stretch ourselves to the end of the physical. You ever did this? I can't do it. I'm overwhelmed. That's enough. I got to cut back. I got to pull back. I got to change some stuff. God's like, finally, I can work. He's like, if you would just get there when you had one thing to do, we wouldn't have to go through all this. What if we depended on him right away instead of when we got overwhelmed? Amen? How come we don't pray about him with bills until we can't pay him? Pray all bills. Yeah, I got that. I got that one. What are we going to do about Lord? He's like, hey, pray over here. Pray when you do all your bills. Amen? No, but we like to wait till it hits the fan, right? Then we were like prayer warriors. We were activating the prayer chain. We're like on Facebook. Hey, I don't want to tell you what's happening. Please pray for us. And I mean, I think we should be posting that every day. My wife says, hey, someone called and said they feel like they should be praying for us. Do you know why that is? I said, yeah, because we need prayer. Please pray for us. My wife like, please. Like, that's not like, huh, cool, fun. Pray for us. Right now, let's all just, you know. but we need that. As we start to be stretched and tested, things start to happen. Remember I told you the multiplication comes when things are connected. So what the enemy wants to do is disconnect it. As we move into the new building, 
and it's unsettled, the enemy's going to try to sow discord when, the, when God is trying to bring unity. See, if we can take every situation in somebody else's life and make it about us, then we'll never help them. Think about that. Have you ever found out something that was going on in somebody's life and it started out with concern for them and within 15 minutes you were talking about yourself and every, your thoughts about everything in your life? And you stopped praying and caring for them and now it's all about you and how you feel about it? That's the flesh. It's in those times you go, hold on. This isn't about Cal. I think about Cal all the time because I am Cal. But this is about somebody else. And I'm going to stop thinking about me and how it makes me feel. And I'm going to start praying for them because they're going through it. And even if it's putting you through something, they're going through it at another level and they need the prayer. And in order to pray, they need to be focused. So this is what I think Jesus does sometimes. And we're like, man, I just don't know. Stop. Look at me. I need money. Look at me. What I have, I will give you. What you want isn't always what you need. Amen? Amen? So Acts chapter 1, verse 8, this is kind of the, the key of Acts. This is, this is when you know the church explodes, and this is why. Because Acts 1, 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, right? He doesn't call you somewhere without empowering you to go. You will receive power. I don't feel like I receive power. Wait and ask. And he will pour out the power from on high. You need the power in order to do the mission. Because if you do the mission without the power, you'll regret, you'll resent those that aren't doing what you're doing. See, if you do something, it makes you think less of people that aren't doing it. You're not operating in the spirit of Christ. Because God will always use the connection or the strength. See, it was what we need now in the church is a demonstration of power, not another book about it. I don't read books from authors because you know what authors do? They write. You need to read books from people that do. Amen? Amen? You need someone that has, hey, this has happened in my life. I've experienced it. I've demonstrated it. Now I'll teach it. Not, I've gathered a bunch of cool, clever <coughs> concepts and I'll make money if you buy my book, even though I've never done any of it. That is so common. You go to conferences and people are teaching you about something they've never done. I don't, I don't have time for that. I'm not against it. I'm just not doing it. I would rather somebody that doesn't write as well, but writes as something that's actually happened so I can actually do it. You don't get it. If you keep telling your kids stuff and you don't do it, don't be surprised when they don't. Well, they don't want words. They want demonstration. If you talk to them about love and talking kindly to people all the time and you're yelling, don't be surprised when they yell. Because they want a demonstration of God's love not to be taught about it in Sunday school. They want to actually get in the car and feel it. Well, yeah. When your 10 year old starts teaching you. Mm. You turn around, and your kid's like, What are you doing? Nothing. Praying for all the saints. That's what the Bible says. A demonstration is more powerful than a description. Kids will watch you, though, what you do more than what they listen to what you say. God demonstrated his love through Christ on the cross. He didn't just talk about it. He demonstrated <coughs> it. So when you tell people you love them, there should be a demonstration, not just a description. Yeah. Amen? Amen? People know when you genuinely love them. And look, I know people have different capacities based on where they've been and cultures and certain things like that. You know, there's a, there's a few cultures I enter into, you know, you don't just go up and hug the dudes. They're like... I mean, if you touch them on the shoulder, that's like sincere affection. They're like, wow, that's, that's good. But that's as far as it goes. So we have to practice what we profess. It's great to talk about things, and you should, because those are the seeds. Talking to your kids, this is what we do. This is who we are. This is what God's calling us to do. This is our calling. Right? I am the one that. It calls me. I, I'm like, she had a calling from God. I don't know how it worked tied into the movie, but my kid's been singing that for like days. It's in my head. I just like shining when the turtle sings and you're welcome. This. But anyways, so the first thing I want to talk to you about is the partnership or the power in the partnership. See, it wasn't Peter. You know, Peter preached your first sermon. It probably was under 15 minutes. That could be a lesson for a lot of churches. It doesn't have to be 
eternal to be everlasting. <laughs> Preaching longer doesn't always make it better. He's like, amen. I get hungry. <laughs> but it was Peter who preached the first sermon. 3,000 gave their life to Jesus that day. He had a cover. But you know what? Peter didn't go alone. Peter went with John. Peter was bold. And John was like steady. When they're at the Last Supper and Jesus said, one of you will betray me and everybody started arguing, John just laid on his chest. I'm here. I don't even know what's going down. <laughs> right? But Peter was bold. Usually spoke out, got called Satan. You know, a couple checks. I want to bring a couple guys up on stage. Joshua, will you come up? And Willie. Woo! I purposely chose two people who would stretch them just a little bit to come up here. These are awesome guys. I asked them when I asked them to come up, they're like, yeah, I don't know. I said, do you trust me? And they both gave me a blank stare. <laughs> so I don't know what that means. They're like, kind of. I trust Jesus in you. <laughs> so those of you that follow Joshua and Shannon on Facebook, they're very bold. You know, testimonies, professions, when they're out, when they're out, they're comfortable in the setting of just reaching new people and just sharing all the time. Joshua um, makes shirts and sends them out to all over the place, all over the place. And, you know, so they're just really vocal everywhere they go, everything they do, anytime they're just very vocal about it. So Joshua has like a Peter spirit on him. And then there's, there's Willie. Willie is just consistent. <laughs> you know, he's just consistent all the time. Willie's just super consistent in everything he does and everything he says. You know what I mean? So a lot of times we'll say, oh, be like this. No, listen to me. The dynamic is in the difference. Amen. See, Peter didn't heal the man. John didn't heal the man. Peter and John healed the man. Yeah. Jesus always sent him out in twos, but we think we got it if we go out by ourselves. There's a dynamic here, and that dynamic is where God moves. But what we try to do oftentimes is remove all the differences and expect the dynamic. God did not create you as an individual to turn you into a copy. Okay? So you have the bold spokesperson and you have the consistent disciple. Which is better? Neither. No, don't get caught up. Don't get confused. God wants it like that. The day the church all tries to become the same, we lose becoming the individual body parts. We glorify one. We put another down. We do this. But it took, you know, Peter was running to the temple. He's driven person, right? He probably wouldn't even have noticed the guy if it hadn't been for John's compassion. Willie is a compassionate person. He's always thinking about those in need, right? So Peter was busy. I got to go. I'm going to do this. I need to talk. And then John noticed. But then if Peter wasn't there, John might not have said anything. He might have went, man, I'll pray for him. But Peter stepped up and spoke. So it's the and. It's the dynamic. It's the power of partnership. So my question to you is who's on the other side of your and? Who is the conjunction? Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. Iron does not sharpen iron this way. It dulls it. It's when you appreciate the angles or the differences. Stop trying to make people like you. Let's all be like Jesus and appreciate the differences and fulfill the gospel. We have people that invest in this church that can rarely attend. Thank God for them. They see their role. They believe in what God's doing and they do it. So we're not establishing a tier structure. What we're doing is trying to fulfill the Great Commission. Right? So the man is down and the men are up. So, you know, he's here. It takes the compassion of John, but also the boldness of Peter. You know, and he says, it said he took him by his right hand and pulled him up. You know, John did nothing. He didn't even help. <laughs> he sat there and watched Peter and goes, man, that's good. <laughs> no, do you get it? And Peter would run back and go, well, I was the one that helped him up. Right? It was them, not him, and not him. So as Peter helped the man up, John was a part of it. See, you need to understand that everybody has a role. You guys can stand up and fall. I usually do this alone, but it's a lot funner than you guys up here. <laughs> so it's together. It's the conjunction. It's the end. You know. So it's like when they went to the tomb. We know they raced to the tomb when Jesus was resurrected. Right? Well, John got there first, but stayed on the outside. Peter got there second, but was the first on the inside. See, we need someone on the outside watching our back. Why somebody goes on the inside and mixes it up. 
Do you see the balance? Stop trying to portray someone and pull them out of how God created them to make them like you. Because God wants you to be like you. God needs the Joshua's. And God needs the Willies. God doesn't want Willie to be like Joshua or Joshua to be like Willie. He has this crazy thing that he wants them both to be like him. And they are awesome. And the team, and when we come together in the church and we appreciate that, God can do anything. See, John and Peter were partners before Christ. Fishy, right? And God says, I'll use your partnership for something better. I'm going to redefine your motive and your occupation. You were a fisherman, and now you'll be a fisher of men. Right? But he still used the dynamic and the partnership. Look, we are as strong as we are. We are better together. Well, I can do this alone. You don't need to do it alone. You need to do it together. You know what I mean? Joshua and Shannon are very vocal on Facebook. William Dulce are just some of the most caring, compassionate people I know. Always praying, always believing. You know what I mean? We're trying to connect. We're trying to connect some mission stuff that we're working through. But just because you don't see it, don't think you don't know it. Amen? So who's on the other side of your hand? See, people don't have to share your perspective to share your purpose. Did you get that? Yeah. People don't have to share your perspective to share your purpose. Somebody wants to argue about how to accomplish the purpose instead of everybody just trying to accomplish it. <laughs> then it's not even about the purpose. Now it's personal. Like they said to D.L. Moody, I don't like the way you evangelize. He said, I don't like the way you don't. <laughs> right? Batman needed Robin. Robin needed Batman. I need Bethany. Hopefully she needs me. <laughs> but we are better together. If you're trying to make your spouse like you, you're missing the point. You need to appreciate the differences and allow Christ to reign. And then you can operate together because you're better together. Why do you think he says if two or three are gathered? I think gathered means more than hanging out in the same room. It means connected right or two things i am in their midst if you agree in anything on heaven and earth it'll be done we're talking about agreement come into an agreement with your brothers and sisters in christ so we can accomplish the goals because i'm going to tell you once we allow ourselves to be stretched the kingdom will be expanded everything god touches he expands and then he touches us and we go whoa we don't want to stretch well then the kingdom won't expand amen how many are willing to be stretched? Raise your hand. Hold on, let me get my camera. <laughs> Look, his hands went down quick. Like, you know, there was this time back in June. Zoom in on the camera. Just send people that text. How you doing? You know, man, I just... Uh, I love this picture of you. I just want to tell you that. So I you. In Jesus' name. I have a prophetic word for you. <laughs> So Peter and John are partners. This man had partners. Okay, they were partners. And they came up with this man had partners because someone dropped him off. Someone transported him, right? To the gate called Beautiful. It says, hey, they dropped him off every day. That's a commitment. So we don't know if it was someone for business that, hey, you go and bang and I'll get a percentage of it. Or the professionals. Or if they're just good buddies that always lo love this guy. And he's crippled. They said, well, at least we'll drop him off and help the best we can. See, there's partners in our life that do the best they can but they don't have ability to take us to the next level. We need a new level of partnership to go a new level in our life. If all your partnerships have already leveled off, there's no level up. Amen? Amen. I've been hanging on the same people for the last 15 years and none of us have leveled up. Mm. I'm not saying ditch them all. I'm saying get some people that will challenge you to stretch you. When you get around people and you talk to them, it should stretch you. There should be some irritation because that's the sharpening. Iron only sharpens iron as it appreciates the angles. So if you're talking to people that only you agree with, there's no angle. Right? So you need to be sharpened. You need to be challenged. You need to be a little bit irritated because that makes you think. How you guys doing? Awesome? All right. Acts 3, 2 says, Now a man was lame from birth. So he's weak from the womb, was being carried to the temple, to the gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going to the temple courts. So someone put him there to beg. You know, well, pastor said it like this. He was in a terrible situation, but put himself in a beautiful location. That's a picture of the church. Even when you're in a terrible location, 
you still got to put yourself in a beautiful position. You got to line yourself up. So there's the power of the partnership, but then there's the power of the path. See, it's good to get people to church because it's in the path. And I'm not talking about all the miracles are be done in the church because this miracle was done outside the church. And the majority of the miracles in the book of Acts were outside the church. Amen. Amen. That means the church was actually stretching out, not just pulling in. But did you know, it never shows that this guy had some great motive to be healed or to get money. He just wanted some money. There's no motive, but he was in the right path. So God exceeded his expectation. In the King James Version, it says he was asking for alms, which means money. So the guy was asking for alms, and God gave him legs. <laughs> yeah, that one's mine. Can you blame that one on the Holy Spirit? <laughs> So sometimes you're asking for finances and God's going to bless you in another area. See, God knows what you need. He's looking for a quick fix. He's saying, if only I can get some money, if you can just give me some money. Isn't it funny that he positioned himself outside the church as if the church was generous? How come there's no people positioning themselves outside church churches today? Because they think the people coming out of Walmart are more generous. Think about that. Not my notes. So he said, if I can just get near the people that were going to pray, I can get something from them. See, he was where they were at, but he couldn't do what they did. He needed some new partners. He just didn't realize it. See, some people will help you in your life, but they never actually bring healing in your life. Some of the people that are actually trying to help prevent the healing. People that hang around the hospital don't get healed. Sick people are in the hospital. But when they leave the hospital, Back to their life, they start to experience healing. Some churches have become hospitals. We don't go there to sit and stay in the same condition. We go to get diagnosed, prescribed, healed, and restored. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So maybe you're here today and you're going, you know what? Pastor, you don't got no idea what's going on in my life. I'm just hoping to make it through Sunday. And that ain't next Sunday. That's today. And God says, you've come for a temporary fix. But I have something more for you. You come that you might make it through the day and get some food, but I'm going to help you walk out this life. See, it says instantly he became. When you came to Christ, you became something. But then it said he began to walk. So even though when you came to Christ, you became something, God began something in you that takes walking it out. Amen. It takes effort. It takes effort. It takes effort. So it says, man, we don't like we don't like work. The four letter word we hate more than any other one. Sometimes destiny shows up in overalls and we don't want no part of it. So Peter's boldness, John's compassion, two are gathered, the iron sharpens iron. We don't know about their motives or their condition. You know, a lot of people, it was Corporal Alvin C. York, later Sergeant uh, York, the most uh, decorated um, one of the most decorated soldiers in World War I. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. You have to read his story. He showed up to church. He was a drunk. He did all this stuff. Showed up to church. He was chasing a girl. And Jesus caught him. See, so he came with the wrong motive, but Jesus had the right one. This guy came for money, and Jesus healed him. See, I don't care why you're here. Jesus set you up. Hey, just here for a girl. Awesome. Here's a seat right here. We have a black chair right up front for you. It's special seat. <laughs> Right? God just needs you to get in the path. There's power of partnership and being around people that will help you get places you can't go. But there's also power in the path. Look, if you're having a hard time, don't stop going to church. If you're having a hard time, don't stop doing the thing. Stay in the path and see if God doesn't bless you and meet your expectations. I remember when my life fell apart by my own hands. And I remember getting my head straight and I thought, I got to get back to church. Okay, the church I left wasn't perfect. There was a lot of stuff going on. There was a lot of, I didn't care. I needed Jesus all I knew. I went and somehow I wandered into a Catholic church. The priest preached like a five-minute sermon. That thing convicted me and tore me apart. I left. I was the only one. I was like, oh, my God. Everybody else was like, oh, it was great. They're doing like their communion. Five minutes in the Word of God, and I was shredded. I'm like, I thought everybody knew, you know, so I had to get out of there. All they do is open, I think he opened the Bible and I was convicted. It was like, eh. Because I knew I just had to be in the path. I didn't know 
I didn't know where it was going to take me. I didn't know who's going to help me, but I knew I had to get back in the path. I had to stay in the path of God. There's power in the path. Don't let a situation, don't let a person, don't let a place, don't let a thing, don't let a habit, don't let an addiction pull you from the path or pull you from your partnership. You guys okay? <laughs> See, the cool thing is he said, drop me off by the church. He could have said, drop me off at the bar. Drop me off at the crack house. Drop me off at the party. He said, drop me by the church. See, he knew that there was something that he needed. God can do anything if you stay on the right path. You might think you just need something to get you by, but God has something for your future. And the last thing is the price. The price. You're like, hey, but healing is free. Obedience is expensive. Did you hear me? Healing is free. Obedience is expensive. Like when Jesus healed her, right? Healed the woman. Brought her up. Prayed for her. I forgive your sins. Sin no more. Right? Just a little obedience tag on it. I'm going to heal you. Sin no more. See, Peter got rewarded by this great act of healing this person by going to prison because of his boldness. Guess who got to go with him? <laughs> his consistent friend. <laughs> He's like, I was standing there to help him up, man. I was just standing there. Careful who you hang out with. <laughs> because they'll either lift you up or push you down. John just was hanging out with Peter. He got to go to jail too. Is that awesome? Change will cost you something. If you don't count the cost of the reality, if you don't count the cost of change, then the reality of the challenge will outweigh the strength of your change. Determine in your heart, I'm going to change. Determine I'm going to be stretched and God's going to strengthen me. Determine that I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. Determine no matter how much I'm stretched, how much I'm putting down, how much I'm beaten, how much I'm trod, Christ reigns in me and I will overcome. Get that in your spirit because the challenges are going to come, but don't fall at the challenge. Embrace the change. Have you made the decision that the progress is worth the price? Have you made the decision the progress is worth the price? I'm going to do a cool sermon called the balance or a ser sermon series called the balance life because I want one person just to show me what a balanced life looks in the Bible. I've not found it at all. The way that America defines a balanced life is nowhere in the Bible. I've looked in scripture. I see none. We have an athlete go and they train five days a week and everybody cheers them on. You go to church three days a week. You're like, oh, you're so out of balance. <laughs> we use balance as a manipulation to tip the scales towards what we want people to do. It's called manipulation. That's a whole nother teaching. You guys are like, let me know when that is. I will skip it. <laughs> there's no change if there's no cost. You can't, get you can't get strength without the stretch. You can't get change without the challenge. There's a price of new beginnings. This guy had a price. He got healed. How awesome is that? He got to, he's like, Peter helped him up. You know, he's like, now think about this. He's hanging out, right? This dude's been doing this a long time, right? This is his deal. He's like, man, just drop off some change. And he's like, walk. So Peter grabs his hand now. Now he stretches up and he's like, this guy is going to be sorely disappointed. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? When you can pray for someone, you're like, walk. And they're like, <laughs> you know, we all have that fear, right? That's a real people. Like Peter had to think, see, Peter ain't done nothing like this since Jesus left. He did it with Jesus there, but now he's solo and he's thinking, here we go. You know, what if this guy can't get up? I'm going to pray for him anyways. I'm going to move in faith. He says, get up. And the guy's like, man, this guy's a fool. And as he said, he feels something going on in his feet. And he's like, and all of a sudden, he feels a little bit of faith. Then he starts feeling his feet and his legs get strong. It says, then he stood. Then he started to dance. Then he started to jump. And then he started to freak out. So he had no faith, but Peter had the faith, and he was with John. So he then began to dance. He's like, man, this is it. Now, here's the crazy thing. It sounds awesome that he got healed, but you've got to understand, he doesn't know what to do. He ain't never walked before. You know how scary that is? Tomorrow, no one's going to drop me off at the temple because they ain't no one going to give me no money because now I can walk now. No, I just lost my job. <laughs> you guys don't, like, I'm not, you know, this guy's always dreamed of healing, but now it happened. And I was like, I, I don't even know what to do. I'm going to stay with these guys. 
right? When you don't know what to do, stay close to your healer. And he'll direct your walk. Because though the man knew how to walk, he didn't know where to go. Amen? It was scary. So it says this, he danced. When the band held on to Peter and John, it says, all the people were astonished and came running to them to the place called Solomon's Colonnade. See, the thing is, there's a price of new beginnings, new relationships, walking out of the old and walking to the new. We, we don't see it here because we think you got healed. That's awesome. But there's still the rest of the story. So maybe you're used to yelling. Maybe you're used to not turning the other cheek and punching back. And you don't realize there's a higher glory in being like the Lord, not getting caught up in worldly stuff. Maybe you're argumentative and all you know how to do is argue and win the argument. Maybe you, all you know is drugs and addiction. See, God says there's a price to coming out, but you have to walk it out. See, there's things that we're comfortable in in our life, manipulating, lying, cheating, stealing, whatever it is. These are our little go-tos. These are our little place where we sit. And God says, don't sit, but stand up and walk out. And it's scary because you know what? I've dealt with people with anger problems. Like they are afraid that if they're not angry anymore, they won't even know who they are. No, if I'm not pissed about something, I really don't even know what to do today. Because I'm used to striking back and lashing out and saying negative things, a negative attitude and feeding it. Now I'm supposed to be positive. I'm like, I feel like I should be mad at something because I don't know how to receive peace. So we all have our own handicaps or liabilities of God saying, you know what? Don't stay there, but stand up and walk it out. It's scary, but it's worth it. So this is cool. Why the man, check this out. Why the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished, came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. You would think the church people would have been excited for the guy that got healed. Well, you know a church folk. Right? We think we'd be excited when someone's trying to be ministered to or help. But you know a church folk. We're not convinced that Jesus will do a good enough job of judging, so we've taken it upon ourselves to have opinions. That's what real Christians do. Did you hear what they said about that pastor in the news who wrote the article? Don't even care. I'm going to repeat it and be offended. It's not church folk. I've been trained to just regurgitate stuff that's negative towards the body of Christ because that's what church folk do in America. We're a lot like the news. Now, I've never heard more negative comments about the church than the people in it. Don't do that. <clears throat> It's not about being against everything. You need to start being for something. We're to be stretched that we can reach the city. You don't got to worry about what's going on in Missouri. I mean, you can pray for the people and care and do that. But the church, you're in that church in Missouri. You, you and Chandler care about the person next door. <clears throat> Amen. Be stretched. Not on Facebook. In your life. I love this because it says it's weird because the man was leaping. And then it says. While the man held on to Peter and John. He was leaping a minute ago and now he's leaning now. No, he was dancing. He was all about it. Then they went to go and he was like holding on to him. That's why I pick big guys. <laughs> right? Isn't it like that in your walk? Sometimes you're leaping. Sometimes you're leaning. It doesn't say that Peter was offended. It says, hey man, I just gave you legs. Lean on your own breakfast. Peter used it as an example of what God had done. But there was a time that began something. He was still leaning. He was leaping, but he was leaning. That's because his mentality didn't catch up with the reality. God has healed you. God's doing a work in your life. But you need to renew your mind so your mentality will catch up with God's reality. And then you can walk it out. Amen? Yeah. I might have you up there every day. Pray that they'll come back. <laughs> I know it's like that, and I know change is hard. And change in areas that we really want to change is easy, but change in areas that maybe not so much, maybe more difficult. Look, what we want today is we want your mentality to catch up with God's reality. We got to be stretched. If we're going to do something in the city of Chandler, if we're going to do something in the state, in the nation, in the nations, we got to be stretched. You can't stay the same. Count the cost and be willing because I'm going to tell you what, when you allow God to stretch you, he also strengthens you. 
Don't allow your past to keep you from the call of your future. Amen? Come on, let's be standing. Lord, we just thank you for this day. I thank you that you've called us here to remind us, Lord. Though there are days that we're leaping and there's days that we're leaning. Lord, that your promise is that you'll be with us always until the end of the age. Listen, God is with you. You can and will change. He will help you. Understand the value of partnership, the value of the path. You've heard it said, if you're going through hell, keep, keep going. Keep going. Do the next thing for Jesus. Don't worry about what everybody else thinks. Focus on what God's doing. The world will be filled with distractions, but God will give you a direction. I pray right now, Lord, as you stretch us, Lord, that you would be gentle and kind and direct us. Connect us with the right people. Keep us in the right path, Lord, and help us to understand. Help us understand that the price is worth the progress. I speak a new you that's coming. Changes in your life, a renewed faith, a breath of inspiration. Understanding that you don't have to be like anybody else. You just need to press into Christ. That he's going to use all of us with our own temperaments, our own personalities, and our differences. He's going to lay aside our perspectives and direct us to his purpose. I thank you for everybody in here today. If you're in here and you've never given your life to Jesus, that's why you're here. That's where change starts. Maybe you came looking for a girl, a guy, to friends, bored, make fun of the pastor, whatever you came here for. You can heckle, it's okay. Nicole does. Whatever you came here for, God had something more for you. He didn't come that you would make it through the day. He came that you'd walk it out through your life. He loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to walk on the earth. He was blameless. They beat him and they nailed him to a cross. And he hung there for six hours praying the price for our sin. He literally took our place. He died that day on the cross. They buried him in a tomb. And six hours later, or three days later, he rose from the dead. The Bible says if you believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth, you'll be saved. Change has come. If you've never given your life to Jesus, on the count of three, I'm just going to give you an opportunity. Simply just raise your hand and put it back down. You're just saying, Lord, I understand that you want to change me. Regardless why I'm here today, I found that I'm in the path. And I need you. One, two, three, just raise your hand. Anybody in there? And then anybody else? I'm gonna stare until you all rub this kid. I'm on here too. You can have you can have fun in the presence of God, you know that? It's allowed. So if you're in here and God's touching you, don't leave the same. Let him start the work. Maybe you're in here and you need to rededicate this morning. If that's you, just raise your hand. Let me pray for you. Awesome. I can already see that God's doing a mighty work in you. You know he says, don't, don't worry. He knows your pain. But he sees your future. And through your pain, he wants to show you your pain. He wants you to have the hope and the joy. He's so excited. Anybody you need to rededicate. Amen. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to tell you, you were never called to do this alone. That we were to walk in partnership. Connect with people in the church. Stay connected. If you're able to attend a connect group, get, get connected to the family of God. And see if he doesn't do a work in your life. Lord, I just release everybody, release a blessing. Lord, that you prepare our hearts for change, this new season, this new building, Lord. Keep the church intact and may it stretch that your kingdom may expand and channel. We speak that over our neighborhoods, the city, 
the state, the nation, and the world, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand. God bless you all. See you next week. We will still be here one more week.